Johann Sebastian Bach wrote a lot of music. A lot of music. And a lot of that music is organ music. As organists, we're really proud that Bach was one of us, and more than any other composer with such universal musical appeal. I suppose it's nice to feel as if Bach represents us. His organ compositions span multiple genres, but no matter in what style he composed, Bach always set the bar and set it extremely high when it came to the quality of his craft. Which is why it's so baffling to think that it all but fell out of use after his death until Felix Mendelssohn revived it a hundred or so years later. And since then, with tons of new additions and authentically informed performances, it's fair to say Bach's music is as strong and alive today as it's ever been. Welcome back to episode six of Chiff Chat, where we talk about organ music and stuff. So I've been doing this for over a year now, and I just thought we've barely talked about the grandfather of organ music, J.S. Bach. So let's talk about him for a bit. I will admit at this point that I don't play all of Bach's organ music, but I sort of know enough of it to make a pretty informed go at today's topic. And that topic is my top 10 favorite Bach organ works. Oh, how original. Episode six, I'm already doing a top 10. Talk about scraping the bottom of the bank. All right, I know top 10s are a bit played out, but this one's a little bit different because we have a very special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome, J.S. Bark. Hi everyone, you alright? How are you doing? Really nice to be here today. Um, hi Bark, you, you having a nice day? Yeah, not bad thanks. Uh, did a bit of composing this morning, a bit of organ practice, then just played a bit of Fortnite and had a Domino's. Alright, oh, didn't know you were a bit of a gamer. Listen, don't take this the wrong way or anything, but your accent sounds a bit funny. I thought you were from Germany, just sounds a little bit like you're from Derby or something. Uh, nope. Oh. All right then. Well, without further ado, let's get on to number 10. Number 10. Okay, starting with, I hope, a fairly uncontentious pick, the Fantasia in G, BWV 572. This piece has no surviving autograph, which is why it's been transmitted with various different names. Uh, Fantasia, Fantasy or even pièce d'org. Bit curious this last one, there's not really anything French about it. It's in three sections. The first is for manuals only, and the repetitious nature of the joyful cascades of semiquavers give lots of opportunity for echo effects. triumphant pedal entry heralds an amazing extended exercise in five-part counterpoint. We actually play this middle section on its own for the end of funerals at the oratory. It's the perfect way to end a funeral mass with a solemn, dignified processional that's still uplifting. You have to change the final chord to G major though, which I know is a bit heretical. Special mention has to go to the ascending bass line towards the end. It's so cathartic following all the suspensions through until you finally reach the top. Don't forget, D was often the top note of the pedal board on Bach's organs, so it runs nearly the entire length of it. There's also this strange note, unique to Bach's organ works, that's too low for modern organs to play. Organists have worked out ways to get around this that usually involves adding a 16 or 32 foot reed stop just for that single note to give the illusion of the added octave. Or you could just skirt the issue entirely and make a lot more work for yourself, like my friend Richard Gowers who just plays the whole piece in A-flat major. I mean, talk about making a mountain out of a molehill. Anyway, then that section is dramatically interrupted by a diminished seventh chord. And we get the cascading semiquavers from the first section returning, but this time even quicker and with much less diatonic harmonies. Some of the chords here are absolutely bananas and it really demonstrates that Bach wasn't afraid to prick up the ears of his listeners by going in totally unexpected directions. The whole piece is such a winner, except in this case, where it's only number 10. Number 9. Next, we're going over to the so-called Leipzig chorales, or the Great 18. These were chorale preludes based on well-known Lutheran melodies that Bach wrote in his Weimar years, but then collated and reworked them in Leipzig in the last 10 years or so of his life. In this set, there are a number of coloratura preludes, 
that is to say, melodies with elaborate ornamentation and melismatic decoration, accompanied simply, usually by the left hand and pedal, but not always. Schmuckedig o Liebe Seele is a communion texted hymn and is perhaps one of the most beautiful examples of this style of writing. It lilts along in triple metre, with a saraband feel emphasising the second beat. And despite all the ornamentation, the melody is incredibly elegant, feeling very lazy and horizontal, if you know what I mean. Number eight. Hi there, uh, hi. Is that the agency? Yeah, hi there. I booked J.S. Bach for my programme, um, but there's something a bit funny about him. I don't know, he just seems a bit off-brand. What's wrong with him? Well, he sort of only moves his mouth. It's really freaky, actually. So, right, oh, so you don't do refunds. Okay. All right, well, thanks anyway. When you think of Bach's organ music, it's hard not to think of pieces in trio texture. Three separate strands of melody, effortlessly locking together in harmonious beauty. It's basically perfect music. But I'd be lying if I said they don't terrify me. Every organist knows how monumentally difficult trio textures are to make sound natural so I'm hesitant to put my next pick any higher, just down to the fear factor alone. Honestly, it could have been any one of the six trio sonatas, but I'm going for a standalone movement that's a bit more bite-size. The trio on Herr Jesu Christ, Dick Sult und Svend is actually the very next piece after Schmucke Dick in the Leipzig collection, but don't worry, the whole list isn't going to come from there. I love the cheeky head motif that naturally forms the basis for the material of the whole piece. The chorale melody even makes an appearance in full in the pedals towards the end, as the counterpoint continues in the hands above it. It's an excellent movement for concerts, as it's very brief, about four minutes, so the concentration endurance element is quite manageable, and it's a really light-hearted, positive morsel of bark, and some of his best. Number seven. Bach's Klavier Übung, or Keyboard Practice, part three, is surely one of the crowning achievements of the organ canon. Home to some of the most complex but emotionally potent liturgical organ music of his day, it's a comprehensive musical thesis covering a range of styles, all to immaculately high quality, which is why it was so hard to pick just one piece from it. Funnily enough, it's not the Saint Anne Prelude and Fugue which bookends the collection although that's obviously absolutely amazing. No, I've actually gone for the third big setting of the Kyrie. The Kyrie Christe Kyrie pieces, 669 to 671, have their roots in the plain song Kyrie Fons Bonitatis. In respect to this, Bach composed them in the Stile Antico, the old style, which typically employs large note values, alabrev time signatures, and quasi-vocal lines moving almost entirely by step, with fairly conservative range. The modal influences of all three large settings, namely having seemingly unrelated final cadences to the opening material, tie them strongly to the Italian versets in Frescobaldi's Fiore Musicale, a collection which Bach very much admired. It's this ambiguous lack of a tonal centre that lends this trio of pieces a timeless quality. The contrapuntal writing mimics the long cantus firmus notes to ensure the plain song is infused throughout the piece. In BWV 669, the Cantus Firmus sings out in the soprano voice at the top of the texture, while in BWV 670, Christ the Mediator is represented with the melody moving down to the left hand tenor line. Finally, on the full organ of BWV 671, the melody makes its way down to the bass part. And you could see this as representing Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Only at the end of the third Kyrie does the chromaticism surface over the word eleison have mercy. 
as if to prepare the listener for the more modern styles yet to come in the following pieces. And it's really this final section that means 671 makes it into my top 10. Just listen to that ending. Number six. Probably the shortest piece on this list, but no less well crafted than the rest. In fact, it's a testament to how good this piece is that Bach can pack such an emotional punch in just ten or so bars of music. Like Schmucke dich, Liebster Jesu, wir sind hier, is written in a coloratura style but in a much more compact time frame. There are these really yearning dissonances in bars one and nine that somehow bring the consonant harmonies into much greater relief. A really beautiful piece through and through. Right, halfway point. Feeling good, doing well. Do you fancy a game, Bark? Yeah, go on then. Right, I'll say a BWV number and you've got to tell me what organ piece it is. Ooh, okay. That might kill a few minutes. Okay, 552. Five, uh, I don't know. Well, have a guess. I'm not, I'm not sure. Did I really write that many pieces? Well, yeah, yeah, you've got over 1100 BWV numbers. Come on, 552, five, it's really famous. I'll give you a clue. It's got a fugue in it. That doesn't really narrow it down. Hmm, suppose not. Is it Toccata and Fugue in D minor? No, sadly not. It was the Saint Anne Prelude and Fugue in E flat. Oh, yeah. Right, well, never mind. How about another one? 541. Uh, is it Toccata and Fugue in D minor? No, but it is another Prelude and Fugue. Oh, uh, I don't know. Did I write one in A flat? No, it's the G major. Honestly, I thought you'd be a bit better than this. Well, all right, well, I'm, I'm trying my best. OK, last one. You're bound to get this. 565. Five. Alabrev. Nope. Pastoral. Nope. Indulge you below. Nope. Vakatauf. Beg your pardon? Ich ruf zu dir. Nope. Indiris Freude. Nope. Trio Sonata number eight. You only wrote six. Sonata on the 94th Psalm. You didn't write that, that was Roybke. Eine kleine Nachtmusik. That's not even an organ piece. To Carter and Fugue. Yeah? In F major. I tell you what, let's just move on to number five. Yeah, this bit wasn't very funny anyway. Mm. Number five. Full disclosure, I've only put one Prelude and Fugue on this list. And that's a real shame because there's so many heavy hitters. The G major 541, the D major 532 the 9-8 C major, 5-4-7, just to name a few. But I'm going with my favourite, and I'm, I'm not trying to be a contrarian here, it genuinely is my favourite Bach, organ, prelude and fugue, the A major, 5-3-6. While perhaps not as well known as some of the big boys, I find it really understated, but really satisfying to play. Not to mention, lovely to listen to. The prelude's very short, maybe two minutes, and starts off with these sort of scherzo arpeggios before a string of broken chords harmoniously leads us to our first proper cadence. The rest of the prelude is built upon a small four-note figure. Interestingly, the pedal goes up to an E above middle C, meaning if you're trying to play this on an old German Baroque organ, which only goes up to D, you have to get your thinking cap on and do some octave displacement. The fugue subject in triple time, rare for Bach's organ fugues, is so simple on the face of it, but when it gets going, the counterpoint is very complex. 
meaning it benefits perhaps from a gentler registration that's not the typical planum we'd usually associate with Bach's organ preludes and fugues. In this respect, it's quite versatile. I've played it before and after services in the past, and it's worked well for both. If you don't know this one, it's definitely worth the time to have a look. Number four. At one point in his second Weimar period, around 1713 to 14, Bach got a bit bored of composing his own works, didn't you Bach? Yeah. So he decided to do a sort of cover album. He transcribed a handful of orchestral pieces by Prince Johann Ernst and Antonio Vivaldi into solo organ works, which paid homage to the spirit of the original compositions while tweaking them in clever, idiomatic ways to give the illusion they were newly composed works. I've chosen as my number four pick the Concerto in D minor BWV 596 after Vivaldi's L'Estro Armonico, Opus 3. It's a multi-movement work, but starts off in quite a strange way. It's hard to overstate how important this opening is, as it has specific registrations written in the score and demonstrates that performance practice for Bach himself allowed changing keyboards mid-piece. I know that may not sound like much, but don't ever let Baroque purists tell you that you have to play an entire piece on one set of stops. In the opening movement, a dialogue between two four-foot stops on different manuals mimics the two solo violins in the original score. An interruption on the organo plano signals an energetic three-voice fugue. pulsing three-quaver accompaniment backs a beautifully simplistic melody in the slow movement. Finally, two contrasting manuals representing the full orchestra Ripieno and the soloist Concertino group play off against each other in the Ritonello form last movement. Altogether, an amazing work, full of variety and typical Vivaldi spark, given an equally creative treatment by Bach for the organ. Number three. Number three is the Fantasia in C minor, BWV 562. This was written around the same time as the previous entry, in Weimar, and demonstrates to a large degree Nicola de Grigny's influence on Bach. The counterpoint is in five polyphonic parts and the whole piece is built on this short, one bar long motif. By the way, don't forget, one of the surviving copies of de Grigny's Livre d'Org is in Bach's own hand as he copied out the entire thing. The French influences are plain to see. The mordant and the expressive Pagetura. There are several ways to interpret this and I like to give it a bit of inégalité, a sort of unequalness of touch that chimes well with the French Baroque accent of the piece. It's a piece that works just as well on the fonds as a profound reflective work, or on a German plenum as an imposing funeral march, just as it was used at the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II recently. It's a piece I find to be full of pathos and emotion, and it resonates with me every time I play it. Such a cool ending too. It's just a shame there's no fugue to go with it, really. Oh wait, there is but it's unfinished. Bark, what gives? Look, can you just give me a break? All right, look, I'm really stressed, okay? I've got like 20 kids. Number two. Just missing out on the top spot is the longest chorale prelude from the Orgel book line. O Mensch bewein dein Sundergross, BWV 622. Clearly an important tune to Bach, he also used this to close the first part of his St. Matthew Passion. 
This version, however, is a simple coloratura melody and accompaniment that's just so perfectly constructed and sentimentally appropriate to reflect the subject material of Christ on the Cross on Good Friday. If you know this piece, you know there are no words to do justice to its breathtaking beauty, particularly the inspired modulation to C flat major in the last few bars, where you can almost feel the last breath leaving Christ's body. Okay, before we get to number one, there are just so many brilliant Bach organ works that I couldn't possibly narrow it down to ten. So let's very quickly rattle off a few honourable mentions. Prelude and Fugue in D major, BWV 532, terrifying opening pedal solo, amazing double pedal ending to the prelude, absolutely ridiculous fugue subject. Von Himmelhock variations, BWV 769, counterpoint so technically and intellectually sound it makes me sick. Trio Sonata number no. three in D minor, BWV 527, the best trio sonata, don't at me. Vata Unser, BWV 682. How do you make a trio sonata sound even better? You add a melody and canon in both hands and frame it with wonky Lombardic rhythms, so it sounds as if you're sight reading it badly. Saint Anne, Prelude and Fugue in E flat major, comes at the start and end of the Clavier Übung Part 3. The best bookends you can ever have, apart from these. Partita on Zeiger Grusset, a piece for people who can't make up their mind what kind of piece they want to play. Something for everyone here. And the Toccata, Adagio and Fugue in C, BWV 564. Probably should have made it onto the top 10 as it's so good, but I didn't have room. Sorry. What about you, Bark? Have you got a favourite piece of yours? Oh, yeah. What about that really cool one that goes like... Uh... Oh, you mean the Toccata and Fugue in D minor? Oh, is that what it's called? Actually, I'm glad you've brought that up. I've always wanted to ask you. It's long been disputed whether you're the actual composer of that piece. Could you finally reveal all? Did you actually write it? Yes. Or did I? Well, did you? Well, who's to say, really? Well, you, you can say. Did you write it or not? That is a really excellent question. I'd love to answer it, but unfortunately, I died in 1750. What? Oh. Well, we better get on with number one, then. Number one. The Passacaglia, BWV 582. It's hard to argue with this, it's such a strong composition. So fun and satisfying to play, and amazing to listen to. The variations almost telling a story of going on a journey, with so much creativity and invention along the way. It's quite an early work, he probably wrote it when he was in his 20s in Arnstadt. He clearly took inspiration from the ground bass works of Pachelbel and Buxtehude. Although interestingly, where Buxtehude's themes were only four to five bars long, Bach's subject is a full eight, which is quite unusual for the time. Marie-Claire Alain had this theory that a number of the variations mimic chorale preludes from the Orgel book line, which was written around the same time, such as Nun kam der Heiden Highland in bar eight, Von Gott will ich nicht lassen in bar 24, and Herr Christ der Einge Gottes Son in bar 72, which is quite a neat connection to have made, and I certainly wouldn't put it past Bach. Well, I am pretty clever. Oh, hi Bach, I thought you were dead. Nope. Then of course there's the double fugue which follows seamlessly on from the Passacaglia, which uses the ground bass as one of its themes. The momentum Bach creates with the energetic counter subject and the triple meter makes for a really exciting fugue, almost breathless in places. I particularly like this little Jacob's Ladder of Harmony. Then of course there's the dramatic pause on the Neapolitan chord of D-flat major first inversion, which gives us a brief period of silence after 12 or so minutes of continuous polyphony, followed by a short coda to cap the piece off. We haven't even got onto all the numerology references littered throughout as Bach liked to do. For example, the 21 iterations of the Passacaglia theme 
and the 12 of the fugue subject, and of course the symbolism of it being written in C minor, the key most associated with the crucifixion, and some scholars arguing the shape of a cross in the subject. So there you go, my top 10 favourite Bach organ pieces. To be honest, they're all winners, and you could ask me in a year's time and the list would probably be completely different. But I think we can all agree that when it came to composition, Bach was a pretty good egg. So what are your favourite Bach organ works? Neglect your regular job and spend ages making a YouTube video, or better yet, leave a concise comment down below. All that remains to be said is uh, thanks to my special guest, Bach. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Well, that's, that's kind of it, I'm afraid. Unless you've got a really wickedly funny one-liner to finish the video with. Um, oh, I'll be Bach. No, you won't.